It's time for the Roots and Roots show with your host, Greg Rashid, bringing you history and music from the Black American diaspora. Greg and his guest's goal is to root the show's information in your psyche, providing you the roots to expand knowledge within your community. Now here's your host, Greg Rashid. And I want to say swati cop to everyone out there. This is Greg Rashid with another edition of the Root and Root Show. Heard by many people at their convenience on so many platforms online and finding out. And I want to say hi to my new fans out there. I found out in Ethiopia. We got folks all over the world. Let's say hi to those folks. Hi to the folks that continue to listen in Britain and, and so many places. But I always got to say hi to the folks who listen regularly every Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. Mountain Time on KUHSDenver.com, the station created by the one and only, the legendary, the boxing king himself, Henry Archuleta. And I want to tell my friends in Colorado, I'll be back there at some point to visit. Looking forward to getting back there, but I don't want to go right now because I know there's a blizzard there and I just love being here in Bangkok where it's going to be, I think, another 90 degree day. It's going to be wonderful. But anyway, we're going to have, as always, a great, great show. And so we're going to talk about my, one of my favorite subjects, because folks who have listened to me for many years know boxing. And I am just honored to have, you know, it's rare when we get a, a, a Pulitzer Prize nominee on here. And, I, you know, I've had some, I've had actually a couple of winners on here, but this is so amazing to have this gentleman on. I love his new book graphic novel, and it's, Actually, it comes out, by the time people hear this, it'll be out on February 21st. But the name of the book is Last on His Feet, and it's about the great boxer, Jack Johnson. And who I'm talking to today is Adrian Matika. How you doing, Adrian? Hey, Greg. What's up, man? It is so good to be here with you. I wish I was there with you. Oh, yeah. yeah we we <laughs> will meet. As we, as we talk off camera, we'll meet at some point. <laughs> we definitely will meet. But this... I got to say, man, it's this graphic novel. And I, you know, it hit me. I've been doing shows since, you know, in studios, this basic show I've been doing since 2001. You know, now it's online. But I, this is the first time, and I have a number of graphic novels. But this is the first time I've ever interviewed anyone who's written a graphic novel on the air. And it just occurred to me. <laughs> <laughs> like I've never done that. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I'm just happy that you know you're the first one and the first one. And it's a superb book. I mean, I you have done your research on Jack Johnson. It's amazing what you have done with this book. And I just want to know what inspired you because I know you wrote a previous book. I want you to talk about uh, Big Smoke, but what inspired you to write? You know, a graphic. You know, do poetry. And create this graphic novel along, you know, I have to give credit to, to uh, Yusef uh, Valdi, who's an artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. give credit to him. And I wish, I wish, this is when I wish we had video because I would like people to see this book. But what inspired you? Who inspired you to really get into Jack Johnson? Oh, man, that's great. And um, yeah, and thank you for letting me uh, talk about this book. Yeah, it, you know, it's funny, because I think boxing is, you know, a, a pretty masculine sport, right? It's, it's, a, um, it's something that I think a lot of us learn about through male boxers and through other men, but I actually learned about boxing through my mother. That's <laughs> and I learned about Jack Johnson through my mother. You know? um, when we so my, my father was in the military. And so we were stationed in um, Frankfurt when I was a kid. And so uh -huh. we would watch boxing on delay, but it was back when it was on ABC, Wide World of Sports and things oh, like wow. that. And, you know, so every Saturday afternoons, we'd watch it on the um, armed service network. And uh, my mom would get real deep into these fights. You know, we'd be watching, you know, I don't, I can't even give an example, but it would be, you know, Ali against somebody not famous because it'd be on a Saturday afternoon, you know, right. and my mom would be cheering for one of the fighters and going in and, and just so, so uh, invested in the fight. And if the person that she was cheering for didn't win, she would say, um, this is radio, so I'll be polite. F that guy. He's no Jack Johnson. 
And so I had no, <laughs> so you have to, there you have to be this, I've learned, like, you don't have to be polite on here. You don't have to be polite. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> no, you use whatever terminology well, what, you well, want. <laughs> you know, that was that was my mom using the language, you know, and she hates when I tell this story and and, and tell the whole story, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, you know, yeah, so she would go and she would be really absorbed with this and her um, kind of her, her signifier when the person would lose and her disappointment would be to, to surface Jack Johnson. Be like, yeah, you know, he, you know, yeah, he's a fighter, but he's no Jack Johnson. And she never told me who Jack Johnson was. Wow. So. I don't know, maybe this would have been, you know, 1976, 77, something like that. In 2005, I was sitting there in my my home with my newborn daughter watching PBS and the Jack Johnson documentary, Unforgivable Blackness. Came oh, yes. Up. And I saw the, the first scene of it is a picture of him. And as soon as I saw it, I turned the documentary off. And I was like, you know what? I need to go find out who this dude Jack Johnson is. And I wanted to write an essay about learning about boxing with my mom, watching watching these fights with her and and that kind of thing. Uh, but instead, it ended up being a book of poems, which was the big smoke. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, you know, one thing I want to add, the, the reason my mom doesn't like me telling the story is because um, you might be able to hear my radiator pop. And we have radiator heat in Chicago because it's 20 degrees outside. So, Greg, while you're talking about it being 90, it's about <laughs> 70 degrees. Cooler. I remember those days, yeah. you know, and far, far <laughs> away from my memory, but I do remember that. <laughs> you know what? We don't, we don't all need to suffer. You made the right choices, you know. Um, but, you know, the, the reason my mom was so frustrated by it, what gets frustrated when I tell that story is because later on, I found out that the reason she was so invested in these fights is because she was betting on them. <laughs> Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> nothing wrong with it at all, you know. Yeah, but nothing she wrong with that. You know, and like I said, I guess now in my memory, I I remember her losing a lot more than she was winning. You know. Oh, um, oh no. Because because I remember bringing up Jack Johnson a lot. Oh man, because uh, one thing I always tell folks: uh, don't bet on anything you can't fix. If mm-hmm. you can't you can't fix it, don't <laughs> bet on it. <laughs> You know, you don't want to do that, but that that's that's something. That is really something. Your mother, um, you know, that 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 is an incredible story. And I know she is very proud of you. for the previous book, oh, um, Big Smoke, and this yeah. this new one that's coming out. I mean, this last on his feet or live right press. It's you know, and it's just I, I gotta say, man, that um as I'm re- reading the book, you know, and as I said before, you really did your research. And I want to know, is it is that going to be a screenplay? Because I know that, you know the movie. I mean, it, it, you yeah. know, for some of you may know this, they're a little older, may have seen it on years later. The Great White Hope, the movie with James Earl Jones, yes, and Jane Alexander. Yeah. And I like that movie, but it misses so much because it's not really Jack Johnson. It is, but it's not real. Right. Yeah, so, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's really, you know, it's really fiction in a sense. But yeah. if someone could get a hold of your graphic novel, because so many people now are making movies based on graphic novels. And this would be the perfect one to do a, you know, just a series on on something like a HBO or, you know, any of these platforms. Because it is, it's fascinating. It's just amazing. You tell his story in such a incredible way, you know. Between, Thank you, for, yeah. You know, let alone the no. pictures, just the poetry and just how you do that. It's incredible. Thank you. I'm sorry that we had a little lag, so I, it's a, I had a break there, and I apologize. But thank you for saying that, man. You know, what's funny is that the the um. So the way that you write a graphic novel, which I did not know when I started, which is part of the reason it took 10 years, is that you write a screenplay. Oh, really? That's how you write. So I wrote a screenplay and gave it to the, yeah, and then I gave it to the illustrator. Now it's not, it looks nothing like what we started with. There's my radiator again. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. (laughs) Just going, you know. Um, But the, you know, the, what I wrote is nothing like this book. But that that screenplay was the foundation for what we did. 
and then Yusef and I went back and made changes and and reworked sections and, and expanded things um, based on the art that he created. And then I would write some poems and he would write, create some more art. It was a real collaborative effort between the two of us to to build this out. But I wanted to, before I we got too far away from it, I'm glad you brought up The Great White Hope because, um, like you said, it's fiction. What um, Sackler, Howard Sackler was the author of that, that it would, and it was a play to start out right, with. Right, right. Won, won the Pulitzer Prize, in fact. Yeah. Um, and what he did was he took the most salacious parts of Jack Johnson's life, the fact that he was a boxer, the fact that he was uh, a black boxer with a white wife. You know, like he took all of those things and made them the center of the story. Instead of the fact that, you know, Jack Johnson was this, the son of enslaved people. His parents were both slaves. And here he is, the first heavyweight champion of the world coming from that. The first black heavyweight champion of the world. And that he only a quit school. Boxer. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was gonna say he quit school in third grade. He yeah. knew how to speak Italian. Like none of that's in the you know, the great white hope. <laughs> you know, like they went, they went, they moved away from the accomplishments and that and focused on the things that um were melodramatic. You know what I mean? And it's so amazing because um <clears throat> I had just, you know, because, you know, it's Black History Month, but for me, Black History Month is every day, every month. <laughs> but some people online have been putting these, the Black inventors list of that. And I said, well, wait a minute, you're forgetting one person. Mm -hmm. And I put online Jack Johnson, because yes. he's he patenting a number of inventions, a wrench, you know, a, mm -hmm. a car, a anti -car, death device for a car. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy was a genius, you know, like you said, you know, third grade education, played the bass fiddle, fiddle. Mm -hmm. yes, you know, spoke, like you say, spoke Italian, you know, a ronkin tour, as they call him, you know, he was, mm -hmm. he was just amazing. And the thing is, and you mentioned it in the book, people assume, you know, you know and after seeing that movie, I'm sure a lot of that, because James Earl Jones, great actor, but he, did a lot of, you know, more or less slurring words and just saying, you know, talking like he thought people want to hear a black man talk of that era. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, the first time I actually heard Jack Johnson speak, I, you know, this is, I saw like a clip in the, I want to say the early 80s. Mm -hmm. I said, my God, <laughs> where's the dis and dose and, you know, I mean, just talking, you know, just eloquent, like, you know, like someone of his era, like W.B. Du Bois or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was just yeah. so impressed. And you realize this guy, considering, like you said, where he came from, his family out of slavery, the so-called lack of education and, you know, being a boxer in the way he was, this is one of the great, you know, I, you know, you may agree with me on this, but I think this is one of the great American stories. Yeah, here. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't know how much more of a, an American story you can get than somebody who starts from nothing. Like, yeah. absolutely. Like, less than nothing. You know what I mean? His parents didn't own a thing. They didn't even own themselves. Right. You know what I mean? It's just, he's coming, he's coming into this from below zero and figures out a way through his his wits and his fists and his creativity to become the most famous or you know infamous if you yeah. will, white um person in the world everybody knew who jack johnson was because being the heavyweight champion of the world at, at, at his time anyway was like being the toughest guy on the planet right <laughs> you know like that's that's the the sport everyone cares about that's the sport that has the most notoriety and the most money. And that was the sport that was so, you know, well, that wasn't the only one. They were all very aggressive, aggressively uh, exclusive and segregationist, right? Like there was no sport where black and white uh, athletes competed together nope, for the, nope, the nope. highest prize. Right. You know, like, yeah. And so yeah. when Tommy Burns finally succumbed to the pressure, that change, you know, his hubris, Tommy Burns' belief that somehow maybe he could beat Jack Johnson was the turning point. 
you know, like this man was so convinced. Tommy Burns, he's five foot seven and 175 right. pounds, and he thinks he can beat Jack Johnson. Um, you know, he got caught up in the hype, like the white hype, right? They're all like, we know right. black boxers are scared, black boxers won't do this or do and that. And that keeps coming up. And you say it in the, in the you know, if your poems and in the novel that the whole yellow streak thing, all oh, black boxers. Yes. You know, the big smoke, he's, you know, he's yellow. He's, you know, mm -hmm. he's this, he's that. And then I don't think, it's not in your book, but I read it in one of the books I have on Jack Johnson, that that master he mm -hmm. makes, you know, I had new respect after I read this quote from him. He said, you know, how can this, you know, Negro be yellow in this society? To paraphrase it, being mm -hmm. a champion, fighting, you know, in hostile crowds, how can you call him yellow? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. How are you gonna? How are you gonna accuse a man of cowardice who every day he walks out of the out of his house, somebody could murder him, and nobody would say that thing? Yeah. You know, you know how how like that's the opposite, right? It's the opposite of of, of being a coward. You got to be brave enough to just live. You know, right. being black at the turn of the century meant that you, you know, you just had to have enough bravery. Like you had, it required bravery just to go to work. That's right. You That's know? it. Just, just get up so, and go to work. Yeah. So the, the idea of getting into the ring with a, a, a white boxer who was always going to be inferior to his boxing skills, that's not scary at all. Oh, no. You know, that's no, just, no, like, that's the easy part of the day. Oh, yeah, it definitely is. And we can say, honestly, too, you know, in America, unfortunately, right now, as we're talking, it's still, in some areas, it's still like that. Yeah, yeah, you know it what we're is. saying. Well, I just you know, I've, I've, like I know we're we're talking about Jack Johnson, but I, you know, I think about how difficult it is to be the first. Yeah, you know how difficult it was for him to be the first black heavyweight champion. How difficult it was for Barack Obama to be the first black American president. You know, um, it doesn't matter what the the marginalized community is. Doesn't matter if it's women. Doesn't matter if it's uh, people of Asian descent. The first person to be able to like sort of break past that has the most difficult experience of Jackie Robinson you know like right. they have the most the the they have all the pressure of the community all the pressure of history sitting on their shoulders you know and here's Jack Johnson with gold teeth and his fast cars and all of his women and he's just like whatever that's right you know, you know I mean someone who actually this. it's almost like he was <laughs> and you really get into it in the book and the fact is how He's like some, he's dropped in the turn of the 20th century, early part of the 20th century. Like they took him from the 21st century. They right. found somebody just like, okay, you're going to come back and you're going to be this one. You know, it's yeah. like, okay, I'll go back. You know, it, it's just, it's just amazing. <laughs> you know, and I, it, yeah. it's just, you know, just to watch, you know, just to watch his boxing skills and all that. But I want to get into some of the poems in the book. If we talk about the book, sure. and again, if you're just tuning in, listeners, I'm talking to Adrian Matika. He's the creator, along with um, the graphic artist, uh, Yusef Baldi, of the new book, Last on His Feet, and it's on Live Right Press. And I want you to uh, give us uh, one of the poems, especially the first one about uh, the battle world, because set that up, because a lot of people may not know, yeah, I got a lot of younger folks that listen in, they may not know what a battle royal is, so uh, tell them what that is and talk about that poem. Yeah, no, that's great. I'm glad, I'm, I'm really happy to talk about that. This is one of the only pieces that's in a graphic novel that's also in um, The Big Smoke, and it's um, a poem that talks about how Jack Johnson started boxing, and so they would, um, there was a kind of fight called a battle royale, that they would put six or seven uh, fighters in the ring and then they would just would fight each other until there was only one person standing. And when the first time Jack Johnson fought for money, like a um, prize money was in a battle royale here in, in Illinois, in Springfield, Illinois. And they blindfolded them on top of it. Yeah. And then put them in the ring and had them, had them duke it out, right? The the I'm going to read the poem, but before I, what I, I wanted to mention too is that after Jack Johnson became the heavyweight champion, he would referee battle royale. So he didn't think about them as a negative thing. He just thought I about them know. as part oh, of. I never knew that. Box. 
Yeah. Yeah. He would do that. There's a story, there's a story where they said that, well, I'll tell you what, I'll read, I'll read the poem, Greg, and then I'll tell you this real quick okay. story about it. Perfect. Think it'll make more sense. All right. So here's the poem. It's called Battle Royale. Back then they chain a bear in the middle of the bear garden and let the dogs loose. Iron bears, iron chains around a bear's neck won't slow him too much. A bear will always make short work of a dog. Shakespeare said Sackerson did it more than 20 times, dogs and wildcats alike. And since most creatures are naturally afraid of bears, there would always be much of a show in the bear garden. So the handlers sometimes put the bear's eyes out or took his teeth to make the fight more sporting. I believe you need eyes more than you need teeth in a fight for losing them. Either makes a bear a little less mean. Once baiting was against the law, some smart somebody figured colors would fight just as hard if hungry enough. So they rounded up the skinniest of us, had us stripped to trousers, then blindfolded us before the fight. They turned us in hard circles a few times on the ring steps like a motor car engine before pushing us between the ropes. When the bell rang, it seemed like I got hit from eight directions. I didn't know where those punches came from, but I swung so hard, my shoulder hadn't been right since, because the man said only the last darkie on his feet gets a meal. Man, that's something. That, that's amazing. That is something Thank else. You. you were going to, and by the way, I didn't even mention to my listeners that you are also, you're the editor of Poetry Magazine. <laughs> yeah. And was yeah, the, so... uh, Poet laureate for Indiana from what 2018 to 2019. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's so. This the graphic novel um, thing was uh, as a new adventure. Um, wow. Even though I mean it's not new because I've been doing it. You know, I've been working on it for almost a decade. But it was it's different from what I've done for the past thirty years, which is write poems and edit magazines that are, that support poetry, and then also you know, I'm a professor at Indiana University, and so. Almost everything about the work I do day to day is about poetry. And then I've got this new thing that has been so exciting to learn about, which is writing graphic novels. And, and you know, part of that, I was lucky enough to work with Yusuf Dadi, who is a brilliant artist and thinker. And he taught me quite a bit about how to do this. He has a great graphic novel. So he's written 12 of them in French, but there's one in English um, called Monk. That's about Thelonious Monk. And oh, that's wow. how I oh, how man. Two, that's how the two of us got together to work on it. I saw some of the pages from that. And I was like, you know, if you can make Thelonious, like his music dance on the page, then you can handle Jack Downs. Oh, and, he, and he could. And it turned out that when we met, he wanted to write something about, he wanted to do something about Jack Johnson, but didn't know how. And didn't have the, you know, we talked about research earlier, the, you know, the, the, a work that went into building out the world and he you know he just didn't know those things yet but i did i just didn't know how to write a graphic novel so we both wow. came to, with, with you know things we didn't understand and deficiencies but before i get too far away from it um that, that poem is, so you know it's it's a, a it's all true that's how he started fighting and um after he became heavyweight champion he would referee the fights and there's a story that um during one of these battle royales, they rang the bell too fast and he hadn't gotten out of the ring yet. And one of these blindfolded kids took a swing and hit Jack Johnson. Oh. And, you know, not you know, having no idea who's out there, he's just swinging, you know. Right. Uh, but Jack Johnson was like, absolutely not. And just knocked the kid out. Oh, in a tux, he's in a tuxedo and he just like clobbered this kid and got out of the ring. And so he he was a part of this, that system, the part of that boxing culture that thought it would be okay to put a bunch of people in the ring and have them just smash each other until the strongest one or the craftiest one was the last of yeah. it. And so his instinct just kicked in when the kid hit it. Exactly. Yeah, it's oh, just instinctual. Oof. I never knew this story. I never knew that. Man, that, that is something. And for some listeners out there, if you've read Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Mm -hmm. He talks about the battle royal mm -hmm. in it. The, the protagonist in that book had to deal with battle royal in order to survive. So that, that's something too. But that that's really incredible. I mean, that's something to know that about Jack Johnson. But you know, he um the thing you know the the th the main thing of this book is all about Jack Johnson. But you center on that July fourth, nineteen ten battle with James Jeffries and talk a little bit about the significance of that. Not as for 
as much as just boxing and lore and history, but America and maybe world history. Yes, yes. It was, a, it was such a it was such a monumental day um, because you know there there was the the um, the basic history of it, which is it's July fourth. 1910 you know and um the president roosevelt had been calling for the abolition of boxing because he didn't he didn't he was a huge boxing fan but he didn't like jack johnson and so since no none of the white fighters could beat jack johnson he just decided like let's just get rid of boxing instead because this is just we can't have this man in there um and, and so they lured Jim Jeffries, who was the last great white fighter to be heavyweight champion, but he retired out of retirement to take the title back for, as um, Jack London said, you know, take the title back for the white race where it belongs. And so there's this there's this moment in history where we're still in Jim Crow, right? We're still, it's only, I mean, Plessy versus Ferguson was 1897, I think. Right, right. 1893. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're just we're not that far away from, you know, <laughs> people having to sue for the their right to be human beings and for freedom to sue for the ability to go to school. You know, black people couldn't vote yet. You know, there's all this stuff happening. And yet we have a black we have a black heavyweight champion. And so it was a, a turning point, I think, for for the black community, but also for the white community because they fully embraced their racism. You know, it wasn't like it's not it wasn't like it was hidden during uh, slavery or hidden during uh, Jim Crow. But it was, it was open. one of those things where that it was baked into the American, like the fabric of American society. So this is the first time for the heavyweight championship since uh, Jack Johnson became the uh, the owner of the belt that, that I think white white Americans thought that this was their chance. They were going to get it back. And. It was the complete opposite. You know, that's yeah. not what happened at all. So, in, you know, in the history of boxing, it was like sort of the first great heavyweight battle, too. Because before that, there weren't two. I don't think there had been two fighters who were in there. Um, they were perceived to be in their prime. Right. Who, were, who right. squared off in that way before that. Um, at least not for the championship, because there were a lot of great fights, right? But uh, and, and um, in it this had case, world too, significance. It had worldwide, yeah, and it had world, yeah, it had worldwide significance. Yeah, you know, like we were talking about earlier, Jack Johnson is the the toughest dude on the planet, just based on having this this title belt. Even as they're disrespecting him, he's, even as they're undercutting his humanity, he's still the toughest guy on the planet because he's heavyweight champion, you know. And so they drag this guy out who was way way past his prime, you know. Um, in the book, we talked, you know, we, we talked about it and sort of set it up differently. But he was, he had an alfalfa farm. Right. He was running a bar. He was like fifty pounds over over his fighting weight, and they're going to drag him back to fight uh, the best boxer of the era in any weight class, the best boxer of the era in his prime. You know, that just doesn't. That's it the, make the, the worst. It doesn't make any sense at all. And so one of the things that we were trying to figure out how to, to make clear to 21st century readers is how that, um, how that delusion would be possible. You know, like, how could you believe, like, how could you, you know, like, I'm not going to believe my lion eyes or whatever that phrase was, right? Like, how are you going to not believe what you see? But it was a different era of media. Nobody saw Jack Johnson fight. They saw him fight if they were in the crowd. There weren't movies. There weren't, you know, newsreels yet. There were barely photographs. Well, so there were, there were movies. There were. You remember they were. So, so, so yeah. So they had the. They, well, yeah, they had. Well, they had the silent films, right? But yeah. those things aren't. It's not like it is now, where you can turn on ESPN. Is what I mean. Right. I'm sorry. Or that's I, the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Media, yeah. Like yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't readily accessible. You had to pay a nickel to go right. watch the fight, right? And they weren't making those about Jack Johnson because no. they didn't like him. You know, so so people didn't really know what kind of fighter he was. He, because um, on top of this, and I'm sorry I'm going on so long about this, Greg, but it's really important because it's about media, you know? Right. Um, on top of this, you know, what people are receiving about Jack Johnson are these racist accounts in newspapers where he sounds like a minstrel show character. 
and yeah. you know and they continue to say he's yellow and he he can't you know, and, and fight and all you these know, and how they talk so you about got this whole yeah and also how big he is he's he's six he's six yeah. what six one he's maybe six, just six, yeah, he's six yeah, he's, he's six one and did two fifty when he was fighting Jim Jeffries or two forty five. You would think he was like seven five, five hundred <laughs> pounds the way they would describe him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it was it was incredible, um, and also it's a it's a case study in the ways in which um, media can control perceptions of things right. too, right? I mean, because it's not like they had to, they don't have to push very hard. Most of the American population was really happy to hate this guy. They didn't. Have- oh yeah, and, and you got to say too, honestly. And we're going to get to this in a minute, as far as a poem about his wife at the time. But a lot of our folks didn't like that. Uh, you know, I mean, in the book, we. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a yeah. lot of yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah, a lot of um, us. You know, in fact, uh, Booker T. Washington, he was denouncing him. So many folks were at that time. And I want you, you know, before we get to the next form, I just want to say something as far as an analogy to that, because I really had to think, it hit me as I was reading, you know, been reading about Jack Johnson over the years and then thinking back to a couple of years ago. The closest, the two fights I can think of that have happened in my lifetime, in your lifetime too, was one Larry Holmes versus J- uh, Jerry Coon? Because <laughs> yeah. all the racism came out in that. And yes. I remember listening yeah. to that in Washington D.C. on the radio because it wasn't televised. They didn't televise that fight. And the guy who was like given the play-by-play, blow-by-blow, was a white guy. You know, announcer in mm-hmm. D.C. named Ken Beatrice. I couldn't stand this guy. But he was saying every round was like, yeah, Cody's got him, Cody's got him, and he's on the ropes. Holmes is on the ropes. And then the 11th round, oh, they just stopped the fight. Well, Holmes knocked out Cooney. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying, what happened? Then I saw the fight and said, wait a minute. What fight was he looking at? <laughs> he, was, he was watching the fight he imagined. He uh, yeah. To see. yeah. And the second, the second uh, analogy I can think of is in the last couple of years, when Floyd Mayweather Jr. fought Conor McGregor, mm-hmm. and that same racism came out. Some of the interviews I saw, some of the mm-hmm. things McGregor was saying, but some of the press, what they were saying, that this is the man that will beat Mayweather. This is the finally he will set him up, and all of this. Right. And it was so obvious that he, you know, this guy McGregor's just out. He had no business in the ring with him. Like Jeffries yeah. with Johnson had no business. Well, that's but, the, the the great white hope is 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 not a it's not it's not something that was tied to the to the nineteen teens. You know what I mean? No, like no. that. I remember that fight with Holmes and, and and Cooney. I had I have a book called a Map to the Stars. It was about when I was a kid, and that fight was when I was probably. I don't know, maybe 10 or 11. And I remember hearing people talking about the fight and how Cooney was going to straighten Holmes oh, out. Yeah. You know, like these, I just remember being at the basketball court listening to these construction, these white construction workers who were sitting next to us, um, eating their lunch, talking about how Cooney had it. It was in the bag. But, you know, the language they were using, of course, was a lot more complicated than right. that. But, um, you know, in fact, the matter is, we're talking about Larry Holmes, who put Ali in retirement. Right. <laughs> you know, so, greatest who was Ali's of... sparring partner all that time. Oh, like, yeah. This isn't some dude who doesn't know how to fight. But <laughs> you, you know, wouldn't he's... know that. Yeah, you wouldn't exactly. know that based on the media. And like we were talking about with Jack Johnson, the same thing. You know, the yeah, same, the same thing. It's, it's just amazing. But I want to get to, yeah, let me get to, because uh, I can talk to you all day about this. <laughs> I want, you know, I'm so, you know, you put the poem in there about his wife at the time, and it was really, I know, and I'm glad you did that, and you showed, uh, you know, you showed that Jack could be very violent. I mean, he was domestic violence, and Jack Johnson kind of went hand in hand, and you talk about that, and just talk about, you know, talk about, you know, say the poem about 
you know, you're using his wife, his wife's mm-hmm. voice, because it's not much about her as far as writing anything. I think the suicide note, maybe, is the only thing that yeah. I know of. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, the suicide note is there. Yeah, that that's that's true. That's a that's like a replica of what she wrote. Yeah. So this, you know, uh, if you can give my listeners that form right now, that'd be really great. Yeah, yeah. So so I think it's 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 important to know that. So so Jack Johnson was um, married to um, a white woman named Etta, who was a a socialite from Long Island, had a bunch of money from a divorce and this kind of thing, and you know, they, they were um, kind of Bonnie and Clyde about stuff. You know, right. it's, it's easy because he was, because he was so violent and because he was so big to, to imagine that somehow he was, he was like sort of running this relationship, but it wasn't like that. Um, in a lot of ways that they were really, you know, he loved her. Like that was it for him. He just didn't really understand what that looked like, you know? And so I, so in Chicago, I live about, I don't know, maybe two miles from where Jack Johnson is buried, probably not even that much. And um, he's buried in an a old cemetery called Graceland Cemetery, where the person who created Otis Elevators is buried there. Oh, like, really? Bernie Banks oh. from the Cubs. Oh, like, man. it's the place where there are a lot of celebrities and captains of industry buried, the oh. huge mausoleums and things like that. And Jack Johnson's buried there. And on one side of him is his wife, Etta, who appears in the book, she's buried next to him on one side, and his mother is buried on the other side. Oh, man. And so he had these three plots reserved for them. And so, you know, it's like one of these things where even as I was trying to figure out how to to tell that part of the story, I just kept coming back to the fact that, you know, he was a flandering, drinking, like hard living person. And at the same time, he was deeply in love with Etta. And it just was bad for everybody, I guess. So this is a poem that talks about how he saw her and how he saw women. And it's just called Etta. Etta reminds me of silk, gentle and rare, barely there, almost unmanageable in her fineness. Sometimes I worry she doesn't have the endurance for this world. She gives and gives and gives and spoils me completely. Sometimes I worry, giving me so much is too much for her. That understands my pride. She makes me feel like the heavyweight champion just by looking at me. I never put my hands on her. She knows how to pamper and build me up without any of that. She doesn't mean, that doesn't mean she's the only one for me. I love women the same way Americans love Independence Day. I've traveled from Galveston to the Orient and women are shaped the same in every continent. It's the wonder of their hips and the surprise in their smiles. The way a woman can just look, look, can look just like a bright storm after a bright sky after a storm when she wants something. The way women breathe a lullaby when she's sleeping. My heart is called a heart because it tells me to go. But some would try to dictate who I love. I make my own choices in the matter of the heart, whether the woman is colored or is white. The the papers and the politicians don't need to get all stirred up. I'm sorry, I tripped up there a little bit because in the middle of it, it's funny for me to read from the book from the graphic novel because I wrote all these on a page down the line, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm bouncing around the page trying to keep up with the shapes that, oh, that, that you just made from oh, the man. book. It's so it's it's so great, but also it means that I'm stumbling. So I apologize. Oh no, not at all. No, no, that's that's great. That's a great all the poems in there are just so superb and on. I you know, God, I wish we could have another hour or so. Because I went over to, I said 30 minutes, we've gone over that, but yeah, <laughs> I got to get you back on here again. But how can anyone reach you, Adrian? If they want to reach you, do you have a website or anything? Yeah, yeah, I have a website. It's just adrianmatika.com. Um, but then I'm also on Instagram and it's uh, adrian.matika. And I'm on Twitter, it's adrian underscore matika. Because um, somebody already had the dot taken when I got there um but yeah the, I'm around and I'm so so appreciative of you making this the space Greg oh, thank, no. thank you and thanks I'm for just glad you wrote me. you know you're writing these poems you wrote this book and I just so grateful for it hope to meet you in person and again my listeners out there it's um Adrian Matika the book is last on his feet 
It's on Live Right Press, and it's more than a boxing book. It's more than a boxing book. So I don't want folks to leave thinking, oh, I, I don't really like boxing. No, this is history. Mm. And Adrian has done a great job with this as well. You know, and the graphic artist, Yusef, has done his pictures. Uh, it's just, it's just amazing. It's perfect. I have to say it is perfect. But I'll be talking to you very soon, Adrian. We're going to get you back on here. Thank you so much for being on today. No, no, thank you, Greg, and thanks for everybody for, for listening. I appreciate your time. I really enjoy talking to Adrian. As you can tell, great guy. Hope to meet him in person, like I said. Please get that book. Please get the book. Again, as last on his feet, Live Right Press, Adrian Matika. Please check it out. And we're going to do right now, I'm going to go right into some music. This is um from the uh, album. Actually, from an album based on a soundtrack of a documentary about Jack Johnson from 1970. And this is the music of Miles Davis. And I wish I could play the whole album on here, but I'm going to play this one cut right off part one. So let's hear the great Miles Davis on trumpet along with a plethora of this amazing artist. So let's hear this right now, right off on the Root Root Show. <laughs>
All right, I was grooving it in so much I forgot to turn the mic on. But uh, again, that was uh, Miles Davis in his group from 1970. That's from the documentary Jack Johnson, and that was Right Off Part One. And I really like to play that whole album on here sometime. In fact, I like to play the whole Jack Johnson sessions. It's about oh man, that thing's like about five hours long. But if you can find that documentary, please check it out because it's a great you know. Great way if you don't know anything about Jack Johnson, haven't seen him before, you know, check it out, check out that documentary. But more importantly, check out the book, the new book by Adrian Matika, Last on His Feet, Live Right Press. It's easy for me to say, Live Right Press, check it out. Great graphic novel. And I know some of you out there are like, I don't read graphic novels. Uh, you will love this. I love graphic novels. You will love this. Believe me, you will love this. The poetry alone is worth it. But the pictures done by Yusef uh, Dalti, they're, they're just worth it. Check this book out. But again, we're going to get ready to get out of here on the Rubric Show. You know, and I want to say, you know what I'm going to do before I go? Because I, you know, previous week I did a whole uh, tribute to uh, Burt Bacharach who passed. And I played a number of songs. I'm a, um, let me slip, let me see if I have time to slip something in here. Uh, not necessarily a bird backer. So I think I'm going to slip in. I think I'll do the Brothers of Soul, Wait For Me. You know, because I didn't do anything for Valentine's Day as far as music. So I think I'll play that. Fighting for my country And doing the best I can Hoping that I'll be with you real soon you might like that the brothers of soul wait for me on the root and root show but we're gonna get ready to get out of here right now but before i go i want to say one thing uh somebody on uh i'm in many groups on facebook and especially one uh, ones in uh thailand and this one person on there they asked 
Should you celebrate Black History Month even though you're living in a foreign country like Thailand? And I responded to this person. I said, you know, you celebrate Black History no matter where you are, not just one month, but every day. And that person then actually liked my uh, response. But anyway, a lot of people did, but it's celebrated all the time. Don't let people tell you you can only do it a month and that's it. And you can only do it in the U.S. or in Britain, you know, because they have Black History Month in October. Doesn't matter where you are. It's celebrated. Learn something every day about Black history because Black history is world history. So learn something every day. And that's what we try to do on this show. Bring a history lesson of every show we have, even when we're just playing music. There's history involved in it. But anyway, I'm going to get out of here right now. It's Greg Rasheed. Hope you enjoy your day. Go in love and go in peace and help someone along the way, be it a senior, a young person in your community, and love yourself because you can't do anything unless you love yourself and get to know yourself. And once you know yourself, you'll become a better person. And that means if you, it means meditation, whatever you can do. To just relax and get to know yourself and love yourself. But again, this is Greg Rasheed with the Root and Moose Show. And again, I want to thank Adrian Matika for writing that great book, Last on His Feet on Live Right Press. And we'll see you next time. Take care. From Bangkok, Thailand, Greg Rasheed, your host. Take care. Go in love and go in peace. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. And remember, spread the knowledge. Share the power.